Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the biosynthesis of the last class of eicosanoids, and those are the leukotrienes. You can see that biosynthesis shown right here. Before we get into that, though, let's do a brief review of what we talked about in the last video. So remember in the last video, we talked about the biosynthesis of the prostaglandins and the thromboxanes, in particular thromboxane A2. So these compounds all belong to a class of compounds called eicosanoids. So those are prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. Now what was an eicosanoid? Well, eicosanoid comes from the root word eicosane. That's from organic chemistry. Eicos means 20, and eicosane is a hydrocarbon that has 20 carbon atoms. If we look at the precursor to all of these compounds, whether it be prostaglandins, thromboxanes, or leukotrienes, the precursor is this compound called arachidonic acid. Now, arachidonic acid does have a carboxylic acid functional group. It has four double bonds in it. However, it has 20 carbon atoms. And so because of that, they are called eicosanoids, meaning they're derivatives of a compound that has 20 carbon atoms. So here we have the plasma membrane of a cell that's going to generate leukotrienes. Uh, in general, this is going to be immune cells, uh, particularly those that respond to allergic reactions. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we have in the plasma membrane this phospholipid. This is phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, also called PIP2 or PIP2. Uh, we've seen this in various biosignaling pathways, but if we look at this phospholipid, notice that one of the fatty acids on it right here is arachidonic acid. Um, it's in a different conformation than shown over here, but this is just an arachidonic acid fatty acid tail. Well, this inflammatory stimulus through a pathway that we haven't shown here is going to activate this enzyme called phospholipase A2. This is a membrane-bound enzyme, and so it's going to act on this phospholipid within the membrane, and it's going to hydrolyze this ester bond right here, and you're going to get off of it arachidonic acid. Now, arachidonic acid is a very hydrophobic molecule. You can tell that because it's loaded with carbon atoms. So it's going to be acted on by enzymes that are in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the cell. So once arachidonic acid is freed from the plasma membrane phospholipid, PIP2, it then goes to the smooth ER where these enzymes then catalyze reactions on it. Now, Remember that leukotrienes are going to be released during allergic reactions. So consider someone for a moment that has asthma. So someone with asthma goes outside and they're inhaling air outside and that air potentially has pathogens, it has chemical irritants, and that person with asthma has an inflammatory reaction to those. Okay? Um, that inflammatory reaction causes the activation of this pathway and leukotrienes get released. And what the leukotrienes do is they constrict the airways. The logic of that is, well, if they're outside inhaling these chemical irritants or these pathogens, then let's just close the airway so that no, they can no longer inhale those things, right? The downside of that is, of course, well, their airway is constricted, and so now they're having trouble inhaling air. And that's why someone might need an EpiPen or something like that to help open up the airway, right? But that's how these work. They're released uh, in response to an allergic reaction. Another case where someone might actually uh, have these released would be if someone with a peanut allergy. So if someone eats something with either peanuts or peanut oil, Again, you're going to get this pathway activated and the leukotrienes are going to be released and they tend to cause things like bronchoconstriction, constriction of the airways. But in any case, that inflammatory stimulus, whatever it happens to be, activates this enzyme and causes the release of arachidonic acid from the membrane. And now we can have this entire biosynthetic pathway. And what's notable here is that the leukotrienes and other related compounds, as we'll talk about, are actually synthesized initially through an enzyme called a lipoxygenase. That's in contrast to the prostaglandins and thromboxanes, which ultimately have to be made through cyclooxygenases, so a different type of enzyme. Now, the first enzyme in this pathway is 5-lipoxygenase that catalyzes the conversion of arachidonic acid into 5-HP. This is one of the committed steps in leukotriene synthesis, the other being 15-lipoxygenase, which we'll come back to in a few minutes. So 5-HP, this stands for 5-hydroperoxy 
icosatetrinoic acid. That's a long name. Now this E right here, icos, we know that means 20 carbons. Tetrinoic acid, it's an acid, carboxylic acid, and it has four double bonds. That's the tetraene. And then this HP is hydroperoxy. And what this enzyme does is it attaches this hydroperoxy, OOH group, to the five position. Okay, so that's 5-HP. Now, 5-HP is not a leukotriene. We'll look at the base structure of a leukotriene in a minute, but you can sort of get an idea looking at these four compounds down here. Now, 5-HP can then react with h -peat peroxidase, which converts it to 5-heat. Now, heat stands for hydroxy icosatetrinoic acid. And what this enzyme does is it takes the 5-hydroperoxy group and converts it into a 5-hydroxyl group. Now, 5-H heat has some functions um, by itself, but again, it's not a true leukotriene. We may come back and look at the functions of this compound in a separate video. Now, coming down from here, let's talk about uh, the conversion of arachidonic acid to 15-heat. Now, this conversion requires two enzymes. The first is 15-lipoxygenase. Now, 15-lipoxygenase does something similar to 5-lipoxygenase, except it's attaching a hydroperoxy group now down here at the 15 position. And then the h -peat peroxidase converts it to a hydroxyl group. So that intermediate uh, hydroperoxy compound is not shown. Now, 15-heat can go in one of two directions. And notice that both down and to the right, both of these reactions are catalyzed by this 5-lipoxygenase. And which one occurs really just depends on probability. They both occur. Uh, but again, um, it's just two different activities of the same enzyme. So going down, 15 heat can be converted by this 5-lipoxygenase into lipoxin A4. So this is lipoxin A4. This is not a leukotriene. Uh, it might be a time to introduce this. A leukotriene is a compound that has three conjugated double bonds. Okay? Technically, this is four conjugated double bonds, but this has a very different function than the leukotrienes. Lipoxin A4 like other lipoxins, belongs to a class of compounds called specialized pro-resolving mediators. Now this is a fancy term for a compound that mediates or mitigates the immune response. So if we have an immune response to something, we don't want that immune response continuing indefinitely, because that would be very bad, right? We want that immune response to eventually stop, in particular when the stimulus is gone. And once the stimulus is gone, it'll still be there to some extent, but we need to then curb it and bring it back down to baseline, right? So lipoxins and really these pro-resolving mediator compounds, these help accomplish that. They're sort of quenching the immune response after it's taken place because we don't want it continuing on and on and on. So that's lipoxin A4. And again, it's not a leukotriene. Now, the other direction that 15 heat can go is to the right here. This is, again, the same enzyme, different activity. 5-lipoxygenase converts 15 heat into leukotriene A4. This is the first true leukotriene that's made, and so in some ways you could consider it the parent leukotriene. It does have leukotriene function by itself, but as you can see here, it can be converted either directly or indirectly to three other leukotrienes. Okay? That's leukotriene A4. Also notice up here that this 5-HP from the start of the video can also be converted to leukotriene A4, again, by this same enzyme, 5-lipoxygenase. Now that brings us to leukotriene A4. What you'll notice here is we have this system right here of three conjugated double bonds. Now if you're not certain about conjugation, this is an organic chemistry principle, not super important here, but if you notice, um, each one of these double bonds is separated by a single bond. So we have double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. If we come up here and look at, say, arachidonic acid, we have double bond, single bond, single bond, double bond. That would not be conjugated because we have two single bonds separating each double bond. To be conjugated, it has to be one single bond in between each double bond, and we have a network of three of these right here in leukotriene A4. This gives it a leukotriene function because it puts this compound into a particular conformation which allows it to bind uh, to the leukotriene receptor. All right, going right here, we have leukotriene A4 hydrolase. Notice that in this 5-lipoxygenase reaction, it puts this epoxide right here. And so what the hydrolase does is it basically just breaks that apart and gives us a hydroxyl group, actually at two positions, and this is going to be leukotriene B4. Now here again, we have this network of three conjugated double bonds. 
So this is a true leukotriene. Going down here, leukotriene A4 can be conjugated to this glutathione entity uh, by the action of glutathione S transferase. Okay? So it attaches this glutathione moiety onto uh, this position right here where my mouse is. And glutathione is basically just a tripeptide, uh, but again, it changes the property slightly, but it still has leukotriene function, leukotriene C4 which can then be converted to leukotriene E4 by peptidases. Remember I mentioned glutathione is a tripeptide. So these peptidases can clip uh, certain portions of the amino acids off and it leaves it with this right here. Uh, this is an amino acid. This is actually cysteine. Cysteine is a component of glutathione. There's two other amino acids bound to that. Uh, those are glycine and glutamate. And you can see that these peptidases clip the glycine off and they clip the glutamate off, and so all you have is the central cysteine here. And that's characteristic of leukotriene E4. Again, notice this network right here of three conjugated double bonds, thus the name leukotriene. And that is the biosynthesis of the leukotrienes. The major thing to know here, other than the pathway, if you're interested in that, is that we have a different enzyme that catalyzes the committed step. So when we looked at prostaglandins and thromboxanes, the committed step was cyclooxygenase. That converted arachidonic acid to prostaglandin H2, which is the parent of all of these. Once we convert arachidonic acid to prostaglandin H2, we cannot make leukotrienes from that uh, because they can only come directly from arachidonic acid. So in that case, arachidonic acid would have to react with 5-lipoxygenase or 15-lipoxygenase. Either way, those two steps commit arachidonic acid to forming these leukotrienes and some other related compounds like 5-H heat and lipoxin A4. We'll come back in later videos and talk about those in just a little more detail. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the biosynthesis of leukotrienes. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.